We'll try to, and I'm not quite sure whether we can or not, uh, wind up our study of Romans. Early on, when I was going through it, I went through a summary of Romans, which to a great extent is like an outline to the book. And I won't try to go back through that. Um, we did do a little special or give a special attention to chapters nine through 11 at the end of last week's lesson. And uh, what I would like to do in closing is look at some lessons. We try to do that at the uh, end of each book we've studied. Some lessons that may be drawn from the book. And of course, these are just some of them. I wouldn't pretend to say uh, we know all of them. Uh, one of them I would emphasize is found in verse one. That if Paul, as great a servant of God and apostle of Christ as he was, considered himself a bond servant of Jesus, then we should have that same disposition of mind. The idea is from the Greek word doulos, which means a slave. We have, as it were, voluntarily shackled ourselves to Christ because he is the Savior. There's nobody else. Uh, thus, we should have the kind of disposition that says we want to be as closely linked to Jesus Christ in that we wear his name, Christian, members of his spiritual body, the church, as we possibly can. And when we set our mind on that goal, and that's emphasized in Romans 12, 1 and 2, then that makes a difference as to what we'll do with our lives every day where we are. Another thing comes uh, out in verses 8 through 10 of chapter 1, and that is that we need to learn, pray for our brethren, and then I'll say it this way, as the Apostle Paul did. Now, we have all sorts of teaching in the New Testament regarding praying to God, and we might spend a little time on our own and just simply looking up the verses that talk about praying for our brethren. This last week of Sunday morning when I talked about Jude calling those he addressed uh, beloved, then Paul did the same thing Peter did. That should be the disposition of ourselves toward our brethren because they are beloved and we want to pray for them. Uh, sometimes we may not know exactly what to pray regarding any one particular person, but there are a number of things we can pray in general that are always proper. Uh, if nothing else, we pray for each one to be faithful, to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, to know that every good gift comes from God, to be concerned about the importance of Bible study and worship, to be concerned about the lost and the great commission being carried out by the church. We too need to be, and this is probably something that doesn't get spoken of as much as we ought, but Paul made this comment in verse 14, how that he was debtor, a debtor to all men, uh, even to those, of course, who were not Christians, because he was dedicated to preaching the gospel of Christ to them. I don't know that many of us think of ourselves as debtors to all men, people outside of Christ, but we are. When, If you think about who we are, wearing the name Christian, being a member of the blood body, the church, knowing how we became Christians, knowing the mercy of God extended us through the gospel, knowing that somebody somewhere prepared themselves to help us a member of the church, then it should move us to be concerned about those that Paul one time talked about opposing themselves. If we could look at everybody who is out of harmony with the will of heaven, 
who's outside of Christ, who's living contrary to the gospel, is people who are really standing in opposition to their own best interest. It would help us then be mindful of saying and doing those things that would cause them to see themselves as God sees them. I think probably that's one of the greatest things that would help us be a debtor to all men is to see them as best as we human beings can as God sees all men. And that takes time and meditation and prayer and study the Bible to form that viewpoint. We won't spend a lot of time on this because lately we've said a lot about it. And that's what's found in verse 16 of chapter one. And that is that the gospel is the power of God uh, unto salvation. So that gospel has been put into the hands of the church. And we have a cooperative effort as members of the body of Christ with God in Christ our Savior to spread the gospel to those who've never heard it. And that is a tremendous effort that is not just a part-time thing, but ought to be something that wherever we are, we're looking for opportunities to teach the truth to others. Um, we are to realize that we are, as Paul said in Romans 5 and verse 1, justified by faith. Um, to be justified is to stand before God as if we had never sinned. The whole Christian system or New Testament system or the faith, Jude 3, is designed so that we sinful creatures and all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23. The wages of sin is death, Romans 6.23. We're all in need of being justified. And so we are justified by faith. And it's by that faith that we then are to live, verse 17. So this is a lifelong effort. And it's something that is not done lightly. Paul could say that he had not yet attained. But this one thing he did, as he wrote to the Philippians, he put one thing before him. That is the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And that's what we need to be doing. Many who, in fact, I would say the great majority of the people we're around, as far as the world is concerned, think themselves wise. But according to Romans 1, verse 22, in reality, they are foolish. People who will only receive a knowledge that comes through the five senses as they examine the world with those five senses are limiting themselves. And they cannot, to use Peter's words, see afar off. That is, they can't see the invisible. One of the things we can as Christians in the study of God's word and the enlightenment that comes thereby, we have a knowledge of things that most people don't have. And that is, we, we know what is coming. We know what awaits the faithful. We also know what awaits those who die outside of Christ or unfaithful. We know the importance of placing the emphasis on things spiritual or the invisible and not on the things that appear. For what we can experience through our five senses are all going to be gone, including the five senses and the fleshly body that uses them. Thus, we're urged in one way or the other, to one extent or the other, always be dwelling on those things that are eternal. Uh, in verses 24 and uh, 26 and 28 of chapter 1, it's, we learn, well, we learn from those verses that it's a terrible judgment on people when God gives up on them. You know, this is the thing that we who are Christians in America, New Testament Christians and members of the Lord's church, reflect on, I know, to a certain extent, 
regarding the status of this country. And if you're aware of anything about the Lord's church, the problems that are peculiar to it in each member remaining faithful to God. But when God gives up on us, where are you going to go? Where is help to come from? And someday he'll give up on the whole world and terminate the whole project. But when that day comes, we don't know. So as Jesus said, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man shall work. John chapter 9, I believe, verse 4. Um, so we have, there's an end opportunity. Let's put it that way. There's the end opportunity. So we have a time to be active as God defines that activity in the kingdom, faithful living, because there's an end to being able to do that. And that's coming sooner or later. There are, of course, tremendous privileges that are for the members of the church who are faithful to the Lord. But in most cases, those privileges are great responsibilities that we enjoy. Paul deals with that in chapter 2 and verses 1 through 5. That, again, should make us realize as Christians in America that we have so many privileges so many blessings. I don't know in the history of mankind that there's ever been a nation whose government has been formed out of a document such as the Constitution of the United States guaranteeing various rights and so forth and striving to be run by the people and as to how long that will continue, I don't know. Usually things like that aren't just overthrown overnight. They're eroded away over a period of many years. We should think about that when it comes to using the freedoms we enjoy in America that few have ever known in the history of mankind when it comes to working for the Lord in the church and spreading the gospel being one of those works. Another great thing is seen, as we're well aware of, first of all, is Peter perceived in Acts chapter 10 at the household of Cornelius that God is no respecter of persons, chapter 2, verse 11, of Romans, Romans 2, verse 11. Um, some people, I think, get that a bit confused when they say God is no respecter of persons because they'll think, well, God sees the apostles and they had blessings and privileges and responsibilities and even powers that others didn't have. So didn't he respect them by giving them those things? But there's a difference in respect for persons or respect or personages. Uh, who you are and your status in life and your race or national origin or ethnicity or wealth or lack of it, or in a captured country without freedoms or one with the freedoms we enjoy, none of that has any bearing on whether God's going to save you from your sins through Christ by the gospel or not. So what's being said by Peter is that the person in every nation that worketh righteousness is accepted of him, no matter who you are. So when Paul writes to Timothy and says we ought to pray for the men in power, he, he ends that up by saying, for God would have all men to be saved. I don't know that we think sometimes about men, women, in high places of authority in government, uh, whether it's senators or Congress people or whatever, presidents, Supreme Court justices or whatever, God wants them saved just as much as anybody else, and there's only one way that they're going to be saved from their sin. It's the same way we've been saved from our sins and made Christians. So I don't know how many times, going back to what we said earlier about the importance of praying, how many times do we pray for the president, for the senators and the congressmen and the Supreme Court, 
governors and mayors and judges that things will be done in God's providential care, that the church will be able to be at peace and the gospel have free course. And uh, that's one of the things that we should keep in mind, trusting in God's providential care to supply that. Um, but nevertheless, all men are saved in the same way. And that is through belief and obedience from the heart to the gospel of Jesus Christ, Romans 6, 3 and 4. Verses 17 and 18. Paul emphasizes that one is not a Jew, it is one outwardly. Notice how he spiritualizes the word Jew. That one is not a Jew who is one outwardly. But that's not all he emphasizes. He says that, but what he's meaning is this. Neither is one a Christian who is just outwardly appearing to be. The true circumcision that is powerful today under the gospel system is the obedience from the heart to that form of doctrine of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 4. And again, Romans 6 discusses that. It's the circumcision of the heart. It's the inward man, it's the will and the intellect and the emotions and the conscience that's totally converted to Jesus Christ. So it's the inward that we're concerned about, chapter 2 of Romans and verse 28. Then to emphasize the sovereignty of God, what the Bible really teaches about the sovereignty of God and what it really means to be deity is that God be true, but every man a liar, chapter 3, verse 4. When people say, well, why did God create us? Why did God allow this and allow that? Well, who am I to question God? I've said this, and you've heard me say it many times, that the person who says God does not exist and is militantly, as an atheist, opposed to any idea of anything uh, metaphysical, as he would say it, spiritual, especially God or spirits, is mad because he's not God. I know that to be the case because of the evidence they produce in their lives. They're always trying to tell you what to believe. Every atheist is always trying to tell somebody else what to believe and not to believe. The very thing he doesn't want God telling him to do. And one of the reasons that the theory in the case of Darwin, of evolution, was developed. If you're a smart person, intellectually speaking, and you don't want to believe in God, then you're not going to believe in the Bible as the infallible word of God. That means you're not going to believe in the Genesis account of creation. But here you are, and everything else is. So if you rejected God and his word and the Genesis account of creation found in his word, then you've got to come up some way that everything got here and where we are. And you're not about to let yourself believe in God because that means you're his creature. And if you were created by him, you are to be subject to him. And there's where the rubber meets the road. It's our will that we must subject to God's will. Jesus is the prime example, being tempted in every point like as we are yet without sin. And who can read of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane and say that he wanted to go to the cross? I know he didn't. Because he said, Father, he prayed to his Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. But here's the difference in the faithful child of God and in somebody who never obeys the gospel or someone who falls away from the grace of God. Nevertheless, not my will. And what was his will? I didn't want to go to the cross, but thine be done. He subjected 
his will to the Father's will because he loved the Father and loved us and knew that was the only way that man could be saved from his sins. As members of the spiritual body of Christ, with Christ as its only head, then we want to understand that we must subject our will to the Father's will. And even when we're praying for people, uh, I'll just use Ken, for example. I think uh, several, not all of us, were praying for him that he would come through his surgery fine. Now, there's not any of us that thought that it would turn out like this. So in our prayers, we pray not our will, but thine be done. Because we know that there are things that we don't understand nor are in control of. And yet we pray for them. Uh, Paul had some thorn in the flesh. Prayed three times. It might be removed. Knowing Paul, he considered that thing to be a hindrance. The Lord had a different viewpoint. He said, uh, no, my grace, my favor is fish for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. So sometimes things happen to us that we really want and just our perspective really need, we think, have removed from our lives. But that's not the way God sees it. So we all have that disposition of heart if we're faithful to Christ, not my will, but thine be done, and then when it comes to the way of salvation and the way of faithfulness in the church, that's set out in the words of the New Testament. And you see it in Naaman in 2 Kings 5, in that which was written four times for our learning. Naaman had his mind made up as to how somebody ought to act when it comes to cleansing him of his leprosy. And he had to change his will. He had to change his attitude. He was the only one who could do it. He had some help, but he still had to do it. it make a difference how much help you get. You still have to receive that help and be willing to do it. So when he decided to subject his will to the prophet's will, then he went on down to the River Jordan and dipped the proper number of times and came up with his leprosy cleanse. Thus, our faith, which is, if it's proper, formed by the word of God is going to be tested as the years go by. We also learn that by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. Romans 3, verse 20. Now, when you're dealing with denominational people, Baptists and so on, then they're going to look at this and say, see, if we're saved by grace through faith, then there's no law to keep. There is nothing that we are to do. If you try to keep a law and be saved by Christ through that law, you're trying to merit your salvation and earn your salvation. They do not understand that when works and law are used in the letter of the Romans or to the Romans by Paul, he's talking about works of the law. And yet they will run back to the law to try to justify many things they do claiming service to Christ. Yet by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified in his sight. Chapter 3, verse 20. So we must realize that in dealing with people who say the Bible is the word of God, many of them don't know the first thing about the difference in the Old and New Testaments. They have no idea about the patriarchal age and the religion of that age and the part of the Bible that it covers and the mosaical age and the Jews' approach to God through that and the years uh, that it covered and the parts of the Bible it covers. They don't understand the law being nailed to the cross and that we're under the authority of Christ in the New Testament. You know, we may think that people know that, but they don't. And if you get among a lot of members of the Lord's church, they don't understand that. They, have, they don't know the first thing about ascertaining the authority of the one they call king. And yet a king is... Uh, absolute in his authority. Now, where does he express his authority? He's the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by him, John 14, 6. Well, it has to be the will of Christ, but where is the will of Christ? 
It's in the words of Christ. Now, where are the words of Christ? So it involves a study, and people have to understand that all have sinned, all have transgressed God's law, and they're separated from God. We in the church need to be reminded of that constantly because we have the great commission to go out and preach the gospel to every creature. We need to see how also that the Holy Spirit had Paul use Abraham, considering the fact that it's in Romans chapter 15, verse 4, that he says, whatsoever things were written before time for our uh, were written before time for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures, that's the Old Testament scriptures, might have hope. And how did the Holy Spirit have Paul use Abraham? Well, remember, Abraham never was under the law of Moses. Abraham never was a Jew in the sense that those Jews were at that time a descendant of Abraham through Jacob and his sons. There was no law of Moses, if you please, for Abraham. He is, though, the father of all who walk in the steps of his faith. It makes a difference whether they're Jews or Gentiles whoever they are. And he lived and died under the patriarchal dispensation where there was no written law. And circumcision was given to him as a sign of his faithfulness to God. So Abraham is the father of all those who love and obey God. That's what's being said. In effect, all those who love and obey the gospel and continue in the straight and narrow way of divine truth so being justified by faith, that has to be an obedient faith, James chapter 2, Hebrews 5, 9. Then we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now that peace, and we mentioned this many times, is not a peace as the world knows peace. It's a peace that comes by knowing you're justified in God's sight. You've been reconciled to God. You're covered by the blood of Christ because you obeyed the gospel. You are baptized into his death for the remission of your sins. The Lord has added you to the church, which is God's family, the, the body of Christ. And you enjoy the cleansing power of the blood of Christ continually, 1 John 1, 7. Therefore, you can be in a state of persecution. You can be in a state of poverty, even poverty brought on because you are a Christian and you won't compromise the truth but you still have peace with God because you're justified by an obedient faith. We need to know too that we didn't by anything we did or did not do cause God to send Christ and Christ die for us. We were sinners. We were in rebellion to God. We were separated from God, yet God continued to love us and set up a system through Christ to save us, chapter 5 and verse 8. He emphasizes that in Adam, we see how powerful one sin is. It opened the door for sin to enter the world and death by sin, and all have sinned, thus all have died spiritually. And again, remember, death doesn't mean annihilation or going unconscious or ceasing to exist. It means simply separation from God. So when we sin, we separate ourselves from God, but God, while we were all in that state, set up a situation whereby we could be saved. It's through Jesus Christ. So Christ then has restored all that Adam ever lost. Chapter 5, verses 15 through 19. We are in the process by believing and obeying the gospel, living the Christian life. We're in the process of that all being restored. It's still all being done. And when Christ comes again and the judgment's over, this system of material things is long gone, 
and the saved or in their resurrected eternal bodies like Christ's body, then everything will be restored. And we ought to keep that in mind because it'll encourage us through whatever difficult times we go through in this particular life. And there will be some of them brought on directly because we believe the truth and we won't compromise it. A saved person then has died to the love and practice of sin, chapter 6 and verse 2. Now, Paul wrote that, remember, to the church at Rome, to Christians that already heard the gospel. Why does he repeat all of that in Romans 6? Well, he does it to remind them of what they did when they became Christians, exactly the point they became Christians, when their sins were remitted. And he does that to motivate them to continue on in faith. So we would do well to remember that we who are members of the church did the same thing. And that should motivate us to abhor sin and to love righteousness and to not be anchored in this world or the affairs of this present world. So only when a person has been led to the point of believing in Christ with such a living active faith that he has complied with the Lord's will to repent of his sins, Acts 17.30, confess his faith in Christ, Romans 10.10. Thus he is buried with Christ in baptism. Only then is he united with him and raised to live this new life. Uh, This is what's made clear in verses 4 and 5 of Romans 6. We therefore must not let sin reign in our mortal bodies. That's verse 12 of chapter 6. What does that mean? Well, simply because a person has resolved to separate himself or herself from a practice, habitual life of sin, and is studying the Bible, and praying, worshiping correctly, doesn't mean that you can't be tempted and fall by temptation into transgressing God's law. So we need to understand there is a difference between a person who stumbles because he's a human being and falls and then a person who just simply will not change and goes ahead loving this present world to the exclusion of God. Now, in each case, if somebody wants to be restored, then repentance from sin and confession of sin, prayer to God for forgiveness is necessary. But the faithful Christian has a constant disposition of mind uh, that uh, causes that to take place. There's a constant realization in the faithful child of God of the importance of recognizing that we do not habitually, purposely, uh, lovingly engage in sin. We do right the opposite. We do all we can to cultivate loving the truth and living it and doing what it says and having the relationship with one another and everybody else. The Bible says we ought to have. We see then that he says in chapter 6 and verse 17 that to whom we present ourselves as servants uh, to obey, then his servants we are to whom we obey. And that would be whether Christ or Satan. So you remember that back in the garden, they believed and obeyed a lie and thus sinned. But when you believe and obey the truth, you're saved. So that's the reason we're concerned so much about, is this New Testament truth? Is this the will of Christ? And thus studying takes place. From chapter 6, 23, as we've quoted so many times, we see the wages of sin is death. But then he says the free gift of God is eternal life. Free gift. People seemingly can't understand that to receive something freely that you don't deserve, that is grace or favor provided it for you, you can't merit it. You can't work for it in the sense of earning it. That there still can be stipulations laid down for you to receive the free gift. I don't know why that is such a difficult thing to see the difference in acting upon what God said to receive a free gift and trying to earn it by saying, 
well, I've done this and this makes me righteous, so you owe it to me. There, any one of us in this class now could resolve, and we probably have at times, on different matters in our families and the church, uh, decided just to give a gift to somebody. Had nothing to do with the person earning it or even expecting it. But that person had to have some way of receiving it. And we didn't think that they tried to merit it or earn it. We just freely gave it to them. But they had to receive it. And if any one of us gave another $1,000, it's out of clear blue, all of a sudden I'm giving you $1,000. Well, you can mentally affirm the fact that I'm honest in what I said and I've got it and I'm going to give it to you. But you would have to do something to appropriate the blessing to your life. And the same thing's true when it comes to salvation from sin that God has freely provided. We have to, on the basis of faith, do something to appropriate the blessing. And that is believe, repent, confess our faith in Christ, and be baptized for the remission of sins. Paul spends all that time in Romans 6 making that clear. So because we sin, we're paid with death. And therefore, we don't deserve anything and can't marry it, regard, merit it regarding salvation. So God freely gives it to us with certain stipulations. That is believing, repenting, and obeying the gospel. And in Christ, to keep the blood covering us, 1 John 1, 7, we continue in those things God asks of us, studying the Bible, praying, worshiping, doing all those things like that. Those are not meritorious acts on our part. We're not trying to earn our salvation, trying to show our love of God and faith in his system is the reason we comply. Read Hebrews 11. That's the very point that's made in Hebrews 11. By faith, they did this and so. By faith, they did that. Well, faith comes by hearing the word of God. So it was faith, confidence in God, trust in his word that led them to comply with it. So we made, we've been made dead to the law of Moses through the body of Christ. We didn't become Christians by the law of Moses. And we don't live faithful to God in the body of Christ by the law of Moses. We were made Christians by the gospel of Christ, God's power to save us, Romans 1, 16. And we remain faithful as we comply with those things God expects Christians to do. Now, the Christian says, I want to do it. Because I've been saved. I wanted to do the things God required of me. Well, all that doing doesn't mean meritorious works. Doesn't mean an effort to earn anything. It means our effort to receive what we don't deserve. And we have faith, trust in God that when we do so, God through Christ will forgive us all our sins. And our sins and our iniquities he will remember no more. So there's now no condemnation, chapter 8, verse 1. No condemnation to them that are in Christ. We need to do a lot more meditating on and ready to teach those who don't understand the church, the significance of it, of what it means to be in Christ. Remember Ephesians 1, 3, all spiritual blessings in heavenly places are in Christ Jesus. So there's no condemnation to them that are in Christ. And thus you have Galatians 3, 26 and 27 that teaches us by faith we were baptized into Christ. That's where he falls back on the idea that we are then Abraham's seed near according to the promise. So that shows you again the spiritualizing of Abraham's seed that those who are really Abraham's seed are those who believe and obey the gospel and live righteous before God according to the teaching of the New Testament. So as many as are led by the Spirit, he says in Romans 8, verse 14, as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Now, the Spirit leads us in understanding the truth by his word. You won't know the truth of God regarding salvation if you don't study his word. Jesus said, if you continue in my words, then are you my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. John 8, 31 and 32. 
And Jesus said, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth, John 17, 17. So to know the truth and from the heart obey the truth is the same as obeying the gospel. Gospel truth saves us from sin. So it's the Holy Spirit who leads us by the gospel, God's power to save us. Whose gospel is it? It's the gospel of Christ. And when we obey it, we become Christians. And as we follow and ask Christians, the Spirit continues to lead us. Then he leads us, he teaches, he admonishes, he enlightens us as Christians through the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, Ephesians 6, 17. So we need to recognize again, that's how the Spirit leads us and directs us to become Christians and live the Christian life. The sufferings, Paul says, of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the future glory God has for those who die faithful, Romans 8, verse 18. Well, you cannot begin to explain that as far as where our finite mortal minds can grasp the glory of heaven any better than just reading what the Bible says and trying to understand that. And the same is true about the horrors of hell for those who die lost. But sufficient is that word to establish the proper understanding of both places, to move us, if we're honest, Luke 8, 15, to live like the Lord in his word teaches us to live. And he concludes then in Romans 8, uh, 31, if God be for us, who can be against us? But that doesn't rule out our cooperation in compliance with his will, which is the seed of the kingdom, Luke 8, 11. We need to remember that though things can look awful bad, God's always had a remnant that served him. And if you look at 9 and verse 27, they're going to be saved. May not be, but a Caleb and a Joshua. Nevertheless, let's resolve to be that Caleb and Joshua in our time. Because if everybody else is going to lose their soul, why must I? You know, mama used to say, growing up and not kids do, I guess they still do. When you want to do something, you say, well, Johnny and Susie, you know, your playmates are all doing it. Mom would say, well, I guess if they wanted to jump off a mountain, you'd want to jump too. But we think a lot like that as adults. We see seemingly everyone else going to do this. So what's wrong with us doing it? No wonder then there was the injunction of the law of Moses, thou shalt not follow a multitude to do evil. It's just easier to break God's law if you've got companions doing it. So we have to resolve to stand on our own two feet in obeying the truth, whether anybody else does or not. That is, in becoming a Christian or in living the Christian life. So let's like Paul also, and this ties back into what I said earlier, have the thought always on our mind of the need of our preparation and action to spread the gospel to the lost. Chapter 10, verse 1. I don't know how I can say any more about that than I already have, but nevertheless, he said that to the church at Rome in chapter 10, verse 1. I'm going to pause here. There are so many other things we could get. I've tried to go through the book um, and just note some of them, but you can do that. I would suggest as a good way of study uh, it's to read through whatever it is you're reading, but then maybe go back through it with a notebook and every verse you you note these things. There has to be some way you, you incorporate these truths into your life and how you view things. However it works for you, there has to be some way that you do it. So whether you, at first reading, I'd like to think everybody here is not going to be at reading for the first time the book of Romans, but whenever that you're going to be thinking along the line, what does this mean that I ought to be doing? What does this uh, remind me where I maybe used to do something and I'm not doing it now? So all those things are involved in reminding ourselves of our duties to God as faithful members of the church. And that'll be the way it will be all the days of our life, as long as we are in possession of our faculties and think for ourselves. 
That's what it means to be faithful. You couldn't be faithful to the Lord and not entertain those thoughts about yourself, about the church, and about the lost. So we'll conclude here and call this uh, our finishing product of the book of Romans. But remember what I said Sunday morning uh, concerning Jude and also the books we're studying as we are on Wednesday night. Uh, as I'm studying it here, I'm not studying every word and every verse. You're going to have to do that on your own personal study. But I can give some guidance, direction, main points, and what's going on as far as these letters are concerned. So if you have any questions or comments, feel free to unmute yourself and let those thoughts be known.